preparing the stream. Got it. Give me a while, it just takes some time for Zoom to go live. Done. Okay, and we are live. Um, thank you everyone for joining us so early in the morning or whatever time zone you are, especially Lubo Mira. Uh, well, today we, are, uh, we have Lubo Mira, who is director of TPM at Onfido, a global anti-fraud platform, who will be sharing with us the hard thing about hard things, how she scaled, how her team and her scaled fraud pre prevention ML systems from a server in a closet in London to being a global platform. So all yours, Lubo Mira. Brian, thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm really excited for this talk um, because it really allowed me to reflect, actually, on the past few years of my journey um, in this space and all of the challenges that um, we have faced. Um, so can't wait to dive in um, with you. A uh, couple of things. Um, my camera is here you're here and my slides are here so i'll be looking here and i'll try to make the effort to look in the camera as well so you kind of get that experience uh but yes for the most of the time i'll be looking straight and you'll be seeing my profile um apologies for that so uh without further delay uh let's dive in so um as we kind of said we'll talk about how we managed to scale our uh, fraud prevention ML system. Um, and we'll talk about many different things. We'll be light on the code snippets. Um, it's a different type of talk um, and it's at a different level. And hopefully it will give you a different perspective as well. So uh, what is the agenda for today? Uh, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more context about what it means to do fraud prevention in the real wicked world. Um, then we will look at the iceberg underneath the water. Um, we'll go over some takeaways. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have enough time for a good Q&A session um, as well. So who am I? Um, I was born and raised in Bulgaria. Um, and if there are any fellow Bulgarians here, give me a shout. Um, but at the age of 19, I moved to the Netherlands um, to study. And after completing my master's there, I moved to London to start my career. Um, and I started my career at Ford Motor Company. Very, I never expected I worked for an automotive business, um, but they had an IT graduate scheme, which seemed interesting and fun because it provided the opportunity to try many different roles. Uh, for And so for a freshman out of university, that sounded fantastic. Um, so I started as a test engineer, then I did a TPM style role and a PM style, style role. Um, I did many different roles in my four years there and touched various parts and systems of the business from legacy mainframe applications um, to provision vehicles, all the way to digital marketing and CRM systems. So it was a fantastic journey, which exposed me to a lot. Um, and then in 2019, uh, I joined a company called Unfido as a TPM. Um, and for the past three to four years, it has been a truly wild ride. Um, but we'll get into more detail about that um, in a second. Moving on. So just a couple of seconds on this. I absolutely love traveling. I live to travel. Um, I love being active, running, boxing, diving, um, yoga. It really doesn't matter. Anything to keep me active. And as my boyfriend likes to say, to tire me out. Um, so love adrenaline and staying active. And I absolutely love food. Love to cook it. Love to eat it. Love to talk about it. Um, so yeah, this is some of the other topics that um, you can talk to me um, about. So enough about me. Let's talk about more um, interesting subjects. Um, I really wanted to start this presentation with an introduction of what a TPM is. Um, and why is this important? Because TPM is still a fairly uh, new role um, compared to, let's say, engineering, even product management. Um, and it's still not yet that well um, understood. So let's see at some of the key facts about what TPM is. So TPM stands for Technical Program Management. Um, and it's a unique role which focuses on delivering company objectives 
throughout the tech organization. Um, and it usually that, does that by leading complex, multidisciplinary, cross-functional initiatives. Um, and DPM is usually a function as well, which is a driving force behind maturing any technical organization by being a glue and evolving practices process, and processes um, as well. As I kind of mentioned, DPM is a multi-hat role, um, especially in smaller organizations. And to be a good DPM, you have to feel comfortable to be uncomfortable. It's the reality. DPM is also a very hands-on role. We do not push timelines or juggle resources, as I've seen a couple of references on LinkedIn recently. We drive strategy and planning and design systems and architecture, critic RFCs, and drive a non-technical delivery. At least that is my experience, and this is what the TPM team does at Unfido. And at Unfido, we also cover ground from client collaboration, roadmap planning to deep, deep technical initiatives like cloud migrations. And with all of that, being a TPM is really not for the faint of heart. Um, but if it's your cup of tea, like it's my cup of tea, it's absolutely great fun. Um, and how do we do that, you say? Well, we'll get to that, but a little bit later. For now, let me introduce you on Fido and a little bit of our little world. So on Fido, um, as kind of we mentioned, is a SaaS B2B identity verification platform, uh, which offers customers the ability to verify and quickly onboard new users to their services. So as you can imagine, the pandemic, while it was tough for many businesses, it was a very good time for us. And we experienced a lot of growth and scale. The majority of our clients are in the fintech service sector, both digital first, like think any new bank or a crypto exchange um, platform, or digital transformers, think your established banks trying to go online, right? Um, and we operate globally, Europe, US and APAC, but we are mainly London based, um, but we have teams in Portugal, France, Germany, UK, Netherlands, US and India. Um, and we have two main product pillars which are relevant to our conversation today. One is a document check and the other one is a biometrics check. And I'll tell you a little bit more about both of those now. So the first one is a very, very, very high view and very simplified view of what a document check is. So essentially, the goal here is to verify that uh, a user presenting certain document is, actually, uh, is the rightful owner of this document and that the document that they're presenting uh, is authentic and not being tempter, tempered with. So the high level flow looks like this. Um, the user presents a document like an ID card or a passport and submits that document through our API or SDK, which is actually what our actual customers use. So our customers integrate this in their flows. We do some document IQ. So IQ stands for image quality checks um, and enhancements if necessary. And then we have an automated engine um, which performs three high-level functions, classifies, extracts, and performs fraud checks. And if our uh, automated engine is confident enough, um, it provides a result, which is essentially a pass or a fail, right? And if our automated engine is not confident enough, we do have a process of human in the loop, which is our manual processing, um, as is indicated on this diagram. Um, so if the automated engine is not confident enough, we go to the human in the loop and then we get the result. Now, this simplified flow actually consists of hundreds and hundreds of microservices and models. So there is quite a bit of complexity there. And our biometric check flow looks very similar, right? The user is required to take either a photo or a video, submit the media through our API or SDK. And then we have a two-stage process. The first one is we run a number of more lightweight processors, um, which aim again to determine 
how real is the media. Um, and if we have confidence to complete and provide a result in an automated way, we do that with these light processors. And if we don't, we move to more heavier processors, um, which is a different set, again, of models and checks that we perform to determine and, and try to arrive at a result. Now, uh, this process also has a human in the loop part, which I haven't visualized on, on, on this slide, um, but it really looks the same as in the document check. So now, hopefully, this gives you a very basic understanding of what our product does um, and the context um, of which the rest of the talk and the presentation um, will be. So moving on, before we go into a little bit more detail, I think it's really important to go over some context um, of um, our challenges when it comes to developing um, ML. The first thing is, and this is really important, we work with PAI data. We are not working with cats, dogs, trees, cars here, right? Um, and this has a big impact on our operations and on our technology. This means that security and access management is paramount for us. It also means that virtually 80% of external tools, which aim to solve one or another part of the ML development process, think for example, data labeling, um, are unavailable to us because they usually require you to send your data or any data derivatives, um, which still usually contain PAI to their cloud instance. And for us, that's a no-go. When we need to gather data to train a new model or for tests and evaluation, it's a really, really expensive exercise um, and it's slow. The quick feedback loops that you have, for example, with recommendation engines, it does not apply here. So that's a very different environment under which you develop any ML model. The problem as well with uh, working in fraud detection is that by definition, you don't know what you don't know and you're chasing ghosts. Ground truth data is really, really hard to obtain as is accurate measurement uh, of performance. And as I said, you have a feedback loop which varies in length depending on the type of problem you're, you're solving um, and how much data um, you have. And over the last four years, we have evolved from having dozens of models to hundreds of models. So we have the need because of the growth our business is experiencing to scale a lot. But over the same period of time, technological advancements have enabled new and more sophisticated fraud attacks. So it is a race. And it's a race for us against the market and our competitors. And it's a race against the AI developments and, fraud and fraudsters adopting them and trying to pass our checks. So let me start with where we were a few years ago and give you a little bit more context. So about four years ago, when I joined the company, I had two big projects um, to deliver. The first one was to deliver a new document extraction system. And the second one was to complete our migration from our on-prem server, which housed our research data, um, to the cloud, and hence create our new research environment. And back in 2019, while working on shipping my first ML model to production, I realized a few things. There wasn't much in the way of industry expertise and knowledge, not much in the way of best practices or rules to follow. And frankly, it felt a little bit like Wild West. There were many actors and not much knowledge and knowing of what to do. You know, these wonderful diagrams that we all know right now, um, you recognize chips down there. The big blue one is mine from about early 2020. The rest of them are from various textbooks, blog articles, or product pages. But all of these was not explicit or common knowledge, um, let alone used in practice in companies three or four years ago. So this is usually exactly when TPMs come in handy. 
when there is a lot of unknowns. So besides the lack of shared frameworks and understanding of the ML development cycle, uh, there were a few other things which I want to highlight to you, which are a little bit more specific to us and probably other companies um, in the same um, area uh, and around the same age. The first one is that the ML development tooling landscape looked very, very, very differently in 2019 and 2020 than it looks today. To give you a few examples, AWS SageMaker was in relative infancy. Tools like Weights and Biases or Comet were just starting out. There wasn't such a proliferation of data labeling tools, though, as I mentioned, most of them are still no good for us. A lot of experimentation was done in Jupyter Notebooks and show of hands who tried to productionize these. We can cry together in a corner afterwards. And um, the concept of feature and model registry were, well, they weren't widely used outside of the big tech companies maybe. Um, and this is to just name a few, right? The specific for us, the level of, abst of abstraction for our researchers was much lower. And um, our researchers were exposed to a lot of the nitty gritty boilerplate, boilerplate details of actually starting and running jobs and debugging them and managing their resources. Um, nowadays, you can do that with just a few clicks and a nice UI, right? Not back then. We also have a microservices architecture which means that the service graph of our document check alone is this huge web of services. Um, and you'll see why this really matters a little later. Our early models were productionized in such a way that model equals service, which meant to replace a model, you had to, yes, rewrite the whole or part of a service which required, of course, a lot of engineering resource. We also had much more separate culture and working practices between our research team and our engineering teams. And I highlight that because it's often still what is happening, but it's not really talked about. And I think it is really important because it makes a ton of difference in practice. Um, and yes, that also meant some checking it over the wall, back and forth. Um, and in practice, you know how we saw these nice circular diagrams? Well, in practice, a few years ago, the process was very, very linear. Um, and for us, model performance doesn't equal product or business performance um, as well. And we'll go into a little bit more detail um, on that later. A couple of other things. Um, we also didn't really have as we were quite new and still building up, we didn't really have a reproducible process. Um, and our tooling was a bit like a house of cards, barely holding together, which with a big kind of blow, it will crumble. So some of our results were not quite trustworthy or reproducible for that matter. And data management, data management was one of our most important topics. Um, and we've had to consistently iterate uh, and improve how we do that. And of course, last but not least, building and upskilling teams and learning what the hell we are all doing. So with that context, let's move forward. Our goal was to deploy, let's say, a new model to production, right? And I quickly started to realize that while this was our goal, if you look at kind of the top of the iceberg, and I was like, okay, um, more or less knowing what I have to deal with, I quickly started to realize that my problem and really our problem, if you were to scale in any meaningful way, was this vast unknown area under the water level of the iceberg. And this is when things starting to get a lot of fun. So our bigger picture, right? At the beginning of 2020, um, on the back of me trying to work with the team um, and several teams and to put this extraction, new extraction model um, in production, I made the case for starting MLOps at my company. And bear in mind, even the 
um, name MLOps at that point wasn't that widely known. I think we called it ResOps from research operations, right? Um, and we started MLOps with the mission to consciously evolve our infrastructure, our tooling, our processes, and overall system to support us scaling. And I'm emphasizing the word consciously or mindfully um, here because your system and processes and tooling will evolve, period. Much like your company culture will evolve. The difference is it will do that with or without you. So unless you put the effort and decide the direction in which it should go and how it needs to look like, you risk uh, ending up with a bit of a Frankenstein of a system which won't scale and support your business at all. And nowadays, it can also get you in a lot of legal trouble. So we started MLOps. And now you probably are thinking MLOps teams these days are huge, few, quite a few engineers. But at that point, it was a tiny team. One TPM, one engineer, and one DevOps engineer. And I can tell you, this is sometimes all you need to start. So let's move forward. Um, this is, I had to blur it for um, obviously uh, security and privacy reasons, but this is just to illustrate you our first draft of our roadmap, right? Of this kind of iceberg. And just for a little bit of context, this was still missing whole areas of accuracy testing, data labeling. And this was just the technical part because the audience of this was our CTO. So it was technically focused. It is missing the rest of the organization. So we'll go a bit more in detail uh, into that. And yes, the way we internally in our MLOps team joked is that it is a wild west and we need to be the sheriff and start organizing a little bit the town. So let's, let's move forward. Now, as I showed you on the previous slide, there was a lot of work and a day won't be enough to go through all of it, right? So I've decided to pick some of my top favorite projects, right? Um, in that work, which I believe made a lot of difference. So what are my favorites? Migrating to the cloud and multi-cloud, which spoiler alert, alert failed. And for the keen of you who have had experience in this space, um, I'll be really interested if you can put in the comments or in Slido some of the reasons why you think this failed. I gave you the end result. Just give me the reasons why you think this failed and we'll compare notes afterwards. The next thing, experimentation pipeline, which, spoiler alert, actually took years. Quality control, scope crept. The company, product, and technology link wasn't quite as straightforward as we like to think or the nice diagrams depict. And last but not least, something that is really not spoken about a lot, and I think it's crucial, crucial mind the audience, and planning and stakeholder management matters, even if you don't like it. So let's dive straight into the first one. From server to multi-cloud and back. So in 2019, I kind of touched on that, but our research infrastructure was pretty much in-house server, in a cupboard, in our office, and some very, very rudimentary tooling allowing you to basically start jobs and train a model, right? That was pretty much it. So we set to migrate to the cloud, of course, and we chose AWS as we were extensive AWS users um, for our production. And just to clarify, when we say we moved to the cloud and started using AWS, that is not AWS SageMaker. So what did we do? We created a separate environment, which we called AWS Silo, um, Inventive. And we needed to use a way for our researchers to log in and use this environment and the login was essential because again, we are working with PAI data. So we use Citrix virtual machines for the researchers to log into the environment and perform their work. This allowed us to control who is logging in and the activity they're doing, which was a must for moving to the cloud. So 
Data will be periodically synced and updated in this environment and researchers or anyone else was absolutely not allowed to work with PI data outside of this environment. Neither they were allowed to export data, only results, right? And now I don't know if any of you have used Citrix or any other virtual machines in your work, but this can be painful. Uh, they can be slow and prone to crashing. Um, but while not ideal, it was manageable for us at that moment. So congratulations, we moved to the cloud, which is very good. However, in 2020, a few months after we've migrated our researchers to using this new environment and they were getting used to it, used to their new setup and how their new workflow worked, we needed to replicate these with another cloud provider. There are only three, so the second one is Azure. This was due to main, two main reasons. One was financial, financial incentive and another one, the risk of vendor lock-in. I'm sure you've all kind of faced the same choice. So while myself and our engineering team managed to replicate the setup we had with AWS in Azure fairly smoothly and eventfully, nothing really to report there. At the end, we hit a major problem, right? Um, and this major problem was not technical. It was user adoption. Since our researchers recently migrated to AWS, they were resistant to migrate, migrate again to Azure. And even more so, they, res they were resistant to using both at the same time, which is what we were asking them. We were asking them to do part of their work in one cloud and part in the other. Um, and that didn't go down so well. It was slowing down their work. The user experience was poor since they had to switch between the two environments, again, using virtual machines. And well, the setup was the same. There were subtle differences in naming conventions and how you execute some processes. So after a few hard months of iterating and trying to push adoption in whatever TPM means I had, we decided to cut our losses and move exclusively to AWS. So my lesson here is not technical. It's not to choose AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or any other of the smaller cloud providers, right? My lesson here is that sometimes the technical aspect is not your biggest challenge. Your product or your effort will live or die by user adoption. And that's valid everywhere. I'm really curious to see the results, but we'll talk about that in the Q&A. Now, moving on to my second favorite project, or maybe even the first one, because it was quite complex. So building on the previous point, one of our absolutely biggest problems was our ability to experiment quickly, uh, receive accurate and trustworthy results of these experiments, and being able to track and reproduce them without a huge engineering overhead. Now, let me explain why this was a challenge for us. Um, as probably you're thinking, no problem in my organization with that. Well, if you recall a few slides back, I mentioned that we have an extensive microservices architecture. Initially, model equals service. And we have just created a siloed research environment. And let me be clear that these three together equals the ML ops team crank in a ball in the corner, right? Visualize the little Slack emoji. Um, it was that big of a problem for us. And why? Because in a nutshell, it meant that we were not able to experiment live. We couldn't replicate our production architecture in this separate siloed environment. And even if we could do that, it would have been tremendously expensive financially and engineering resource-wise. And even if we did it one off, it would be out of date in about a week. So it was simply not an option. So of course we had individual models in that environment, um, which then the team could use um, to kind of train another model or as pre-processing or to compare results. 
But the problem is that even these models, they were often different than what we observe in production. Recall, model equals service, right? So the results weren't really 100% trustworthy, which is what you want in our system. So that was a big problem. And it was one that took us a very, very long time to, to solve. Why? Because there was a very big technical challenge, but also because there was difference in opinions in terms of how can it be solved and how it should be solved. So what did we do? First, we had to evolve our architecture. And this is our production architecture. And separate model and service, bringing it to a place where we have a service providing inputs to a model and taking its outputs. So we can swap models in and out more easily. And we can have clear separation of concepts as well. This took a long time, really long time, because we had to rewrite a lot of our services and change our architecture. And this was a big exercise, a big TPM exercise, an engineering exercise in its own merit. But of course, that's, that's not enough. You still need an experimentation pipeline, right? Or a way to launch experiments. So the next thing we did was um, to, build, to build a small Python app in our production cluster, which can essentially start an experiment by creating a separate namespace and a branch with a few containers which contain the merge request of your experiment. With this new created experiment, you could give it a name, and provide your new model that you want to test. And the uh, app will map them to the orchestrator of the particular service and model that you want to experiment with. And it will send essentially part of production data through this separate branch as well as through the normal production flow. Um, and that will allow you to essentially conduct your experiment. Easy, right? Straightforward, right? It took us quite a long time and work to get there. Um, this also allowed us to create a registry of the experiments, the data, use the timeline, the naming as well, which was essentially really, really useful because we didn't have a good way to do that um, before. So this has been one of the most significant pieces of work. And I know I make it sound maybe easy and straightforward, but it was anything but that. And yes, no, we don't have a cool name for it. In fact, at some point, we called it research in production, uh, which um, was shortened as um, RIP, which was not a good shortcut for it. So we had to rename it. <laughs> and cool. moving on, quality control. With every ML, I do not think that we spend nowhere near enough time or effort or energy talking about quality control. And quality control is so, so, so important for us because if you recall what I said earlier, fraud detection is a space with a few inherent, inherent, very challenging characteristics. You're chasing goals by definition. You have a longer iteration cycle as opposed, let's say, prediction engines. You um, have to have separate tools, um, and data, um, which you might need to collect separately. And for us specifically, we didn't have the system, tools, and processes to help us label our data and assess our models and system performance um, in a reliable way. So we, decide, we decided to set out and design a new QC system, levering, leveraging our human in the loop production process, which sounds fairly reasonable, right? Well, yes, it is, and it was the right thing to do. But the problem here, again, was not technical. At least it wasn't fully technical. It was a combination of political, where different groups in our organization wanted to own that piece of work and had a slightly different idea of how this should work in practice. Think about the technical stack and solution, but also kind of the, um, the use of it. Because of that, the scope grew to changing the purpose for a tool to measure model performance and label data to a tool that is used for our production human in the loop processing as well. Now, 
there is a solid argument for this, right? Because the measurement between the development of a model and the production needs to be aligned, needs to be the same. However, building a tool for production processing where you require it to train and onboard people and impacts live production metrics, which customers see, and building a tool for data labeling are two very, very, very different things with two very different with very different requirements. And to be frank, on the technical side, we over-engineered it um, by quite a lot. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this as well. Um, so we had to pull back on what we wanted to do um, as well. So the main lesson here is that sometimes, tech, again, technical challenges are not your biggest problems and scope can creep and you need to be mindful of that. And at the point where it becomes unmanageable, actually ideally before that, you have to really remind yourself and those around you, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Having a long-term vision and way to evolve that system, that product or that model or solution is great, but you need to start somewhere to unblock you, right? So this is really important to, to remember. The next one is uh, one that is also quite close um, to my heart and is uh, it's quite fun um, as well. Um, recall when I told you earlier that our model performance does not equal our um, product performance and it doesn't equal our business metrics performance. And it's really, really important to choose the right problem to solve and the right success metric and understand how success metrics really relate to each other and impact each other. So to give you a concrete um, example um, to illustrate this point, assume you're a re researcher, right, in our company, and you're building a fraud detection algorithm, right? So if you're building a fraud detection algorithm, you will want to optimize for how much fraud this algorithm is catching, right? all logical so far, which means that you aim for as low as possible false acceptance rate, right? This means when fraud is submitted to the algorithm and the algorithm says, no, it's all genuine, right? Fantastic. Okay, so you want to kind of minimize this metric. So did we and our researchers. But of course, that's not the only metric, right? And how about your false rejection rate or the percentage of cases where the algorithm rejects a genuine document? If your goal as a researcher is to create the best fraud detection algorithm and minimize the false acceptance rate of that algorithm, what would you say? Is it acceptable to do that at the expense of the false rejection rate? To what extent? And if you manage to achieve this stellar performance on your fraud detection algorithm, but at the big expense of your false rejection rate, would you say this is acceptable? Would the business manager say this is acceptable? This is really important to understand. And it's not that straightforward, but it really depends for your business, the cost between the false acceptance and the false rejection. And for you to really build a, a good ML product, you need to understand that and the context in which you're building it. To pick the right metrics, to map them correctly and understand the impact and the way they interact with the rest of the models in the system and the metrics in the system to make sure that your efforts are used to the best possible way. So that's why it's really important to do the mapping um, and to speak to your stakeholders, to really understand what does it matter for the business and how that translates to your particular work. And I think that's also something that she emphasizes in her book as well. Because otherwise, it can lead you astray and you can waste a lot of time. And the last point um, that I want to spend a bit time on is mind the audience. And what does it mean? Well, following from the previous point, managing your stakeholders and managers for that matter um, really is very helpful thing. So they don't manage you. 
and you need to have trust uh, of of your of your stakeholders in your work. And to do that, you have to communicate often and early. So I'm sure a few of you have um, been in the situation where you've worked on a model or a piece of work which either gets blamed for issues in production, poor performance, or a impact, unforeseen impact on a certain metric, or that is the next big thing that will solve the company's all and every problem, right? If you haven't, I have. And if you have, then you know what I'm talking about. I've had to deal with both of these scenarios. And it is really, really hard. Why? Because it can sway strategy. It can put pressure. It can create false expectations um, and create overall an unhealthy culture and environment to work in. And it can also influence in the wrong direction future technical efforts as well, right? So it is really important to communicate early and often, use data, um, and really communicate outside of your immediate circle of colleagues. Um, step in and actively cut and correct either any legends or um, false statements. And if that feels daunting, again, TPM is your best friend and can help you with that. You don't have to do that alone, but it is important to be aware that you have to do that. So, yeah. These are my top five, um, I think, insights. And they range from technical to system to organizational to people ones, right? And I, and one of the things that I really want to emphasize to you is that we have a better understanding now of the ML development cycle, right? We fall in the cute little diagram, dog or no dog, colors or no colors. It doesn't matter. And the community spends awful lot of time talking about this, but actually there is a world out there. And in that world, for any company, for any business, this is just one piece of the puzzle. And to build a successful product, you really need to understand all of the supporting functions and impacts on your work and the context um, within which um, you're working. So, okay, that's, that's good, but how do you do that, right? Or how do I do that? So it's a lot. How do you start? Well, a few things that you can start doing, and it's usually what we TPMs do very well, um, and where having one as a friend is, is really useful, is break up the silos, right? A lot of the teams, not just researchers, data scientists or engineers, many other teams, right? Um, they work in their own teams and functions in kind of silo or isolation, right? Um, and it's hard to see the vision from one end to the other. And it's really important to see that vision. It's important to understand the bigger picture, the product design, the technical POC, the metrics of, of, of success and the definitions of success of different stakeholders to understand where to place your bets and to put your efforts. It's also really important because it's actually really helpful to use the collective intelligence of your entire organization to help you develop the best solution that you can. And it's also really good for your career. The second thing that is really important is get the basics right, right? Um, and what this means is, again, going back to the point of communication and overall admin bootstrapping, right? Knowing, keeping documentation and communicating early and often, it's, it's important and it can help you really track your progress, communicate it, bring other people on board and ask for help as well and also show your work in the best possible light as well. Planning and milestones. Now, I know the bad reputation that this gets, um, especially kind of in the research and engineering world. Um, but hear me out. When we talk about planning, people imagine weekly or two weeks deep planning roadmaps and someone asking you for, for when this is ready. 
as I said, TPMs, we don't juggle resources and push timelines, right? And it's not about that. But having an understanding and an idea of what your vision is and where you want to go for the next six months or one year is important to guide you, to provide your perspective. And it's actually really useful. You have a kind of fairly vague longer term horizon. And the closer it gets to, um, to the current time, so two weeks, month, quarter, having a bit of milestones or checkpoints for yourself, for your own work, can help you keep you on track and show you when you're maybe spending too much time and effort on something that is not actually giving you results and it's not fruitful. So yes, it's, it's while it gets a bad rep, it's actually a really useful tool for your own work and for your team as well. Dependencies. In a similar vein, managing and understanding the dependencies and the way your model or your work fits in the overall system is really important, as well as understanding how you and your team works in your company organization to be able to highlight your work and to be able to ask for help as well. Products are not models. It's really important um, because some companies, well, some companies sell models, most companies don't. We sell products. And for that, it means that you need to organize, or not you, but your organization will need to sell and market this. So actually uh, speaking with these teams and connecting with them, helping them actually really show the best light of your work for the customer is really, really important. And understand their insights as well of what the market is looking for and what the customer is looking for and experiencing, again, to help you guide your own work. And last but not least, work as one team, right? Again, make friends and uh, go out and understand how the rest of the organization or your team is, is doing and um, leverage the collective intelligence um, with them. Um, and that will lead you to ultimately better results. Um, and lift as you go, share your knowledge and try to improve your environment every day that, that you go. And if you follow some of these steps, I'm sure you will do just, just that. And I think, as I said, parting words, um, to win the race, we all need to be system thinkers, able to solve the system uh, problems in a system rather than in isolation. Thank you very much. Wow, that was a very insightful talk, uh, Lubumira. Uh, thank you very much. We've got quite a number of questions and you can see a lot of claps uh, in the chat. Uh, let me place one there as well. Uh, we have several questions and I'm just going to go down the list. Uh, some of them quite challenging. First one, oh, well. <laughs> what, were some, what were some challenges convincing the research and science team to get on board with ML Ops, engineering discipline and quality control? Oh, yes. It's a very, very, very good question. Um, the main thing was to understand and to communicate the fact that Actually, MLOps existed um, in our organization, exists in our organization to serve the researchers, right? It was really important to clarify that you're our customers, you're our work, uh, users. So we're here to make your life better. One of these kind of like a roadmap that I showed you, the blurred one, we had this version just with the research researcher pain points, right? In their workflow, in their day-to-day. -day. We started, the way we started the function was by sitting and doing interviews with the researchers, mapping their journey, mapping the way they do their daily work and understanding really what were their pain points, what were slowing them down, what was annoying them, and really writing this down. And that's what informed that roadmap. So we had a version for our researchers, and then we had one for our engineering organization, right? Because again, they don't exist in isolation. Um, and for a very long period of time, every we had our researchers kind of had a weekly team meeting. I would go to that meeting every week and update the team on our progress, right? And that allowed us to build this communication, right? They share what they need, we share progress, and when I need to ask them to do something, I also have that relationship and that forum of where, of where and how to ask them to do that. 
So that would be my tip on, on what to do and how to build that relationship. They're really your users. That's what it is. So you need to make that clear and work for them the way you would work for any of your business users. Well, okay, if I can just draw out the, the key point, I think uh, what Luber said was that they worked backwards from the researchers, from the engineers and interviewed them to understand their pain points. I think this helped a lot with earning their trust, right? Hey, you know, we are doing this for you. Uh, that, that was fantastic. Um, okay, one more. Another question. What is one practice or habit you would recommend machine learning teams to help them be more effective? What is one practice? Other than communicating more and mm -hmm. that models are not, and making friends. Yes. One of the things I, if I, if you allow me to, um, if I can, one of it is I really understand your context, right? So where does your model or area that you work on really fits in with in, in kind of architecturally in the, in the, in the production flow, right? Understanding the system that it is part of just to understand the impacts and interactions that it has for us. One highlighting this is for us, this made actually a lot of difference. And only after having a lot of issues, we discovered that. So that's that's um, one thing. Um, and the other thing is um, being really, sorry, just to add to this. So architecturally and kind of technically understanding and also understanding the piece of work that you're working on, really how important it is for the company. Is it what the company's future depends on? Is it a more like an experimentation kind of innovation, like, you know, a kind of toy project or, or is it something that, you know, it's peace and quiet right now. All of these are valid understanding in what environment you are and how you need to behave and uh, kind of reflecting that in your work is, is also really important. Um, and the other just brief thing is, monitor the performance of whatever you put in production actively go and seek it don't expect either a data scientist or a pm or someone else to come tell you hey there's something fishy here you want to catch that yourself that's a great point which brings us to one of the questions that we have that's a little bit low on the list but i think here you go could you share a bit more about the hundreds of models that you have? How do you constantly evaluate and actively prune them to reduce operations costs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really good question. Um, the short answer is work in progress. The long answer is several things. We are constantly updating our um, dashboards and trying to get more low level data, right? That's one thing where we work with our um, analytics team and data engineering. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, we have the practice in our team of weekly production monitoring, right? Where on rotation, someone from the team is actually um, looking at the production results of a model, right? Or a set of models or an area and deep diving and trying to find insights. And they are sharing these with the rest of the, of the group to bring them the insights. Um, so that's one of the things. And what this has led to, what both of these have led to sometimes is to actually disabling models. When we have found out that they do not contribute anything valuable, for example, we have situations where models performance actually in production overlaps, right? Um, and you don't need one of them. So you disable the slower one. So kind of like working with your analytics team, um, proactively going and looking for those and doing, we call it production monitoring, but essentially going and looking at the data, right? Uh, and having a routine for that, not expecting to kind of, um, you know, someone to highlight those to you, um, then has led to us switching off sl slower models. Um, and on purely the technical side, you can, of course, parallelize as much as possible um, and constantly kind of look to optimize um, the models and how they run. Well, it's very reassuring to hear you say that you actually have a weekly on-call that actually goes through this uh, and actually disabling models. May I ask, what proportion of models have you disabled? If you could share a ballpark on what, what kind of gains, uh, I mean, yeah. Mm, yeah, no, it's a good question. And I don't think I can give you a big percentage, but 
we or like an exact percentage, but we have disabled fair few. Okay. Fair few, yeah. Yeah. Even even ones that you know we've thought are a big thing and are absolutely we cannot do without them. Actually, a deep dive analysis of the data shows mm, we can do. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. Uh, that this constant event, it's a good reminder that this constant reminder is very, very important. A lot of times uh, people think that deploying is the finish line, but actually deploying is really just the starting line. Yeah. Um, if I can just reference on one of my slides earlier, if you saw, we had kind of two-stage processing, that helps as well, right? You yeah. only run like a set, and then if, if you have any concerns, you run the second set. That helps as well. Wow, that's a great point. Uh, and brings us to our next question that's similar to that. Um, one ah, on the document check or on the you know the bio check, what's could you share a bit about the breakdown between the auto engine and the manual processing step? Uh, mm -hmm. and also what are could you share a little bit about what are some of the effective light processes? Um, and how how much effort those light processes save? Do the do the light processes take care of fifty percent of it, twenty percent of it, or eighty percent of it? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so I can't tell you too much because then that's proprietary and I yeah. have no, kind of, But uh, just, just to get people thinking about how to be more effective and efficient, right? By cascading their models. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure, sure. So um, on uh, the kind of the first question or the first part of the question, which was the mapping. So it is mostly one-to-one -one mapping, right? In terms of uh, what does the automated engine kind of perform and does, and, and the manual kind of human in the loop process, right? So in terms of what the customer sees, there is no difference, right? We obviously tell them if there was a human in the loop um, or not, but as far as the customer is concerned, there is no other difference, right? Um, so in that sense, it's one-to-one. -one. Um, and when it comes to the light processors, the way we have designed that is taking two main things into consideration. One of it is, actually it's, it's three. One of it is, what are the most common frauds that we have seen, right? So what are the chances, the kind of the likelihood of a fraud occurring? You wanna, you wanna run that. The second um, one is um, kind of speed and efficiency, right, of, of, of kind of the model and kind of how much resources um, it's taking. Um, and the third one is, I lost my train of thought. So if, if I remember it in a second, I'll, I'll go back to it. Um, but yes, it's, it's about like what is most common um, and most kind of value for money, right? In that sense, you run that first. And then only if you don't get a satisfying result, then you go to more heavier, less frequent uh, fraud vector models. That's great to hear. Um, on the document check, uh, what proportion, I don't know again, if you're able to share uh, at a very high level, what proportion of documents are not confident enough? Is it a minority or is it more equal equal? And what helped you increase confidence? So, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of manual checks as well. I'm trying mm -hmm. to eliminate that so that you know it, it is a scaling bottleneck uh, for my team so i just want to learn more from you yeah no it's a it's a very good um question um and now so for us this is um a work in progress so we are actively every year since you know i've been in the company we're working on increasing this um so it really depends so let me kind of put that there it really it's not unified it really depends on the channel through which the media is arriving so api versus sdk is really important right um and this is where it's again when i emphasize that you need to understand the system and the wider kind of business flow with uh um, kind of within which you're working your model will be working it's really important, right? Um, and so it really depends a bit by type of media um, and uh, sorry, type of document. So passport, ID card, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the medium through which it is arriving. Um, but it varies uh, widely between, you know, 70, 80, 90% for some cases, all the way to under 50 for others. So on average, it's about, I think, 60 something, let's say. Thank you. That's fantastic. It, it's also a good reminder, right, for us as scientists and model builders to really rem remind ourselves that 
we have to consider the context, not just the data that comes in, but where does the data come from? Like you mentioned, API versus SDK and the type of data. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Actually, we have a lot more questions. <laughs> We're gonna try it. What are some of the major frictions in aligning expectations across different teams and moving forward projects and project infra and experience? How, mm. how, yeah. So do we talk about overall teams or research teams only? I, mm, I guess different teams, I guess could be product, engineering, research. Uh, what, what was the hardest part about getting everyone aligned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, several things here. The first thing to align on is what is the problem that we're trying to solve, right? Oftentimes, if you prod around that topic, you realize people have different understanding or different intentions of what is the problem they're trying to solve and why. So really aligning and documenting, frankly, what is the problem that we're trying to solve and following on that, why are we trying to solve it, right? What is the criticality? What is the importance? Um, and then one of the things that I really love doing is really bringing, there is time for teams to work by themselves, uh, for focus, right? And for each of us, there are times which I'm in the flow for hours and I just do my own kind of work in peace and quiet. And there are times when we need to be together. Right. And one of the things that I love doing and I love that I see it spreading in my organization is um, having a kind of weekly or every two weeks kind of a huddle right between which is a little bit also outside of your normal kind of planning, um, but between your product manager, engineering, research and whoever other stakeholders are in this um, that you're working with. Right. Um, and understand. What is it that we are aiming to do? How are we doing? What do we need from each other? It's really important to understand what do we need from each other? And then how do we support each other and how do we impact each other? Um, so yeah, understand the problem that we're trying to solve, the why, document it, and then actually don't just go in different directions afterwards and forget about it, right? You need to kind of keep on coming back together um, to, to kind of move as, as one. Fantastic. Okay, we have a few questions. I'm going to do a lightning round, 30 seconds per question. All right. Which team do TPMs belong to? Product, engineering, product marketing? Ooh, um, engineering. Engineering. Okay. How did you iterate to reduce the gap between model metrics and business product metrics? Yeah, uh, painfully. Um, every, every project is an opportunity. Right. Every every work is, is an opportunity. And the other thing I'm doing at the moment with the whole team is actually writing a roadmap. And part of it is, again, not to call them to deadlines, that is not the point, but to link the work that they're doing to the product, to the business. Right. So it's just the linkage, the mapping to visualize, to understand that helps. So every with every every kind of iteration is, is an opportunity to improve there. Okay, so I think we have two questions that are slightly related. Uh, okay, maybe three. How did you deal with the long experiment cycles? Um, and what has been helpful to reduce the feedback loop? So how did I do what, sorry? Deal with the long experiment cycles. Yeah. And uh, what has been helpful to reduce it, reduce the feedback loop? Yeah, no, that's a very, very, very good question. Um, the first thing is, how did we deal with it? The first thing is to understand actually that we had an unusually long um, cycle, right? And, and feedback loop. And to actually understand then if, if you ask, one of the questions I've asked my researchers many times is how much data do you need, right? And the answer is a lot, everything you can give me, right? And, but that's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is what is the lowest kind of uh, volume of data that we need for each step? And how can we get that to help us speed through the cycle, right? The assumption is always we need a ton of data. Actually, we really don't for each step. So one of it is, what is the lowest amount of data that you need for each step? And the other thing is, if you is to kind of shorten and create like little milestones, right? Um, where you kind of, if, if you're looking for this huge model and you know you need all these data and it's doing all these fancy things, break it down, right? 
break it down as much as possible, create smaller chunks on which you can get quicker feedback then, um, and look at how can you minimize um, the things that you need to evaluate its, uh, its performance to help you speed up. Fantastic. So in the context of this long feedback loop, how mm -hmm. could you share a bit more about how you did monitoring? Yeah, um, yeah, sure, I, I can. I mean, uh, I, as I said, we've been on a big, long, hard journey. Um, and, and one of the things that initially, there wasn't much monitoring, quite frankly, right? No escalations, no problems, happy days, we're doing fantastic. Frankly, right? And at some point when problems come up and then, you know, or people are like prodding around the data, they're looking, hmm, this doesn't make sense, right? Um, so you then kind of start discovering things. So I think the fact that you don't see or hear anything doesn't mean everything is fantastic. And proactively go and check um, would be my, my um, two points here. Great. Okay, we have three more questions lightning around. What's your recommended approach to going from functional specs to technical specs designs and documenting architectural decisions? Um, it's a it's a very big question for a lightning <laughs> answer. Um, one of the things is again, first of all, I am a big um, advocate for, you know, everybody has documentation. I hate documentation, but keeping lighting notes, um, light notes between the group you're working with. Um, it's, it's one thing and that doesn't need to be one person rotate you're all doing it together right um, one thing the second thing is again understanding where in the process of the product development you are and which part of the business you're working for I mean um, that can help you understand the urgency and how you need to translate um, either the business requirements or to, um, to technical requirements, um, et cetera. Um, and then honestly, I think there, there are two main things. Either your company has a, a process that, that you can follow and otherwise go find a friend, find a PM, find a TPM, find an engineering lead. You do it together, right? The main thing that I find is the blocker is when people don't speak to each other. Once you start speaking to each other, you, you very quickly uh, understand what are the gaps, right? Hey, we're trying to develop something, but we don't have the full PRD. This is the product uh, requirements document, right? Or hmm, what is the business case of this work that we are trying to do? Highlight that, say something. And then on the back of that, then you can push to for, for this to be created. Gotcha. All right. So hot topic of the month or the year, how did generative AI change your ML priorities? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, like there is no conversation or talk without that question, which I think is fair. And um, let me show you actually just before the call, I don't know if you will be able to see my screen. I saw this Ooh. little cartoon, like, uh, tell me, can you okay, see Okay, yeah, it? we can barely see it. Some chat GPT joke. So it's a joke. So it's basically, it says, what will be the impact of ChatGPT on our business? There is a lot we don't know for sure. Like how much of what it says is made up or it will take our jobs or the security risks or if it could damage our reputation. Okay, and what do we know about it? Only that we want to adopt it everywhere as fast as we can. So um, the joke here, I guess it made me laugh because we, like everybody else, spoke about it for a long period of time, the first few weeks. Then we organized a hackathon around it to see where we can get it deployed. It was interesting that actually the main use cases weren't in our core technology, right? Our core technology, what we were doing at the moment is still um, what is most relevant. But in other more supporting functions like marketing and sales, customer support, et cetera, that's where most use cases were. Um, so how it will change our business? I think, as usual, it will unlock new fraud vectors. So we are bracing ourselves to see what those will be. Um, and the other thing is, hopefully, we can bring our um, kind of uh, technology expertise to the rest of the functions of our business outside of our core technology. Um, and I think those are the two main impacts. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder that, you know, what is core, you focus on the core and don't try to force fit LLMs into 
what it's not really good at. Mm -hmm. Last question, engineers and scientists are transient on a team. How do you manage legacy projects when everyone who has touched on that project is gone or, you know, attrition on when they move on to other projects? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, so a couple of the things. I mean, documentation helps. Documentation helps, right? And that's one of the things. Um, it, it's really important. Um, the next thing is always watch for things that are without ownership. As soon as you have an overlap where knowledge um, is directly handed over, right? This is good. As soon as you get a point where the two do not overlap and something falls, then you lose that knowledge, right? And this is where the, the real problem is. When you have unknown models, unknown services, um, unknown pro owned processes as well. So my main thing is uh, always have an overlap and a handover together with documentation as well. Another thing that generally helps is general knowledge sharing, right? Um, in your organization, you have some flavor or variant of technology catch-ups or kind of, you know, pairing sessions or knowledge sharing. Talk about kind of different topics, different areas, model services, so that you build actually a little bit more general understanding um, of all these topics around the team, right? Um, and the teams um, and pair people sometimes that's that's a, when when applicable this is also very good so yeah great uh, we have one last late question is there a framework for evaluating the monetary costs of false acceptance versus false rejection why would uh, you recommend i mean if you had to send someone a link or something yeah such a such a such a good question um, and this is one which it took us a lot of time to derive, right? And to understand actually what are those costs for our business? Um, there isn't a framework out there that you can just pick and use. Um, it's very specific to your business and exactly what you're doing and understanding the business profile of your customers um, and the cost um, and benefit actually for different customers is very different. To give you a concrete example, you will have these high growth uh, customers, um, picture any new bank or cryptocurrency exchange, right? Which all they want is getting users, right? They don't actually necessarily care about the fraud. Fraud is cost of doing business for them, right? It's literally what they've told us. What they want to do is get people as, 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 in as quickly as possible. For them, that ratio and that trade-off will look different than, let's say, to a company that is really established uh, and it really cares about fraud or to a car rental company, right? If I am a, a fraudster and I manage to get to a car and steal it, it's a very different equation for them than for the guys who care about uh, getting users in quickly. So not a framework, not an easy answer, but understanding what that looks like is, is, is really important. And it will probably vary business to business and use case by use case. Great. Uh, thank you, Lubomira. This was a fantastic talk. A lot of uh, insights uh, from what didn't work well from the multi-cloud to um, the difficulty of creating an experimentation pipeline. Uh -huh, as well as all yes. these questions we had. <laughs>